So I think I think it was it's important to um, give a little bit of definition before I get into the the um, body of the presentation, which is in terms of the pest control industry. I'm going to I'm going to refer to two different groups here. Um, main part of my brief was to talk about pest control service providers, those that are actually doing the application of insecticides or pest control in con countries. Um, but there's also the perspective, obviously, from, from the area that I'm perhaps more familiar with, which is from the manufacturing side and those the, the Crop Life International members, such as those on the right-hand side, which I've already um, referred to. Also, for additional clarity within the definition, um, obviously, we're talking about disease vectors here. We're not going to talk about mechanical vectors of disease, such as cockroaches and flies, which are perhaps more oftenly, or sorry, more, more commonly, um, part of the business remit of pest control service providers. Um, and further on into the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about the differences and some considerations between what you might consider as large international pest control brands, so um, companies such as Rentakill, perhaps Orkin, Terminix, Ecolab, other large companies which have a presence across um, multiple countries, um, and then local or regional companies, some of which with, at a national level might be as large in terms of capacity within a given country as some of those international brands, which might have a presence or an office in, in, in your, some of your countries as well. So next slide, please. I'm also gonna um, uh, highlight this disclaimer here is that um, in representing Crop Life International companies, we are not pest control service providers ourselves. So this is um, the perspective we have from working very closely with these organizations, these service providers, um, we obviously are suppliers of insecticides and rodenticides to such companies. Um, and so the slides which follow represent on the, on the first section where I talk about pest control service providers, it's really our, our understanding and our, and our experience of working with such companies. Um, but we obviously can't speak on behalf of the pest control service companies themselves. And I think that's an important disclaimer here. And if there's if there are things which are highlighted in here, which I think, um, and, and it's really objective of this presentation is to highlight some things which perhaps might prompt further dialogue with such companies at a national level within your countries and even perhaps pest control associations which might exist within, within your countries. Next slide, please. So the first section, pest control service industry. Um, next slide, this is just an opening slide. Um, I really, I really want to sort of explore two things here. One are the, you know, what are the motivations of such companies? And some of this might come across as quite obvious. Um, so my apologies in advance if this is so obvious, but I think it's worth going through those, those key, key points. Um, you know, what are the motivations of such companies? Why would they want to be engaged in being more involved in, in supporting vector control or public health initiatives? Um, and then the second part is what is the typical expertise and capacity of such companies? Obviously, there's not the scope within this presentation to talk, and it's, it's not my place to talk about individual companies. So um, really, I'm just highlighting a few thoughts so that you can consider those and then have, again, have dialogue perhaps with, with directly with companies um, to, to under, better understand that. Uh, and from those two questions, and hopefully exploring the answers to those two questions, It'll help to sort of um, develop an understanding of what might be um, what might be necessary to be able to get them more involved or engaged in supporting public health. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, I guess to get the uh, <laughs> it's not the elephant in the room, I guess, but it's almost close. But the you know let's let's face it, these organisations, pest control service companies, are commercial businesses, and their primary motivation is to make money. Um, they need to make money to um, obviously pay their employees. Some of the international brands might be publicly listed. They might have shareholders. They might be bespoken to some of those shareholders in terms of profit and things. But ultimately, this is in you know, organizations and, um, and employees who are out to, to make a living and they want to be able to make some money and they want to be able to, in some cases, reinvest it to grow their business. Um, Obviously, the, the, the point or the, the key, one of the key points is that that level of profit is obviously defined by the individual business. Um, so, and I'll touch on this in a further slide, but, you know, depending on the size of the business or the ambition of the business, that can influence the level of profit um, that is 
expected from such a business. Um, and I think one of the, and the second point here, this, this is to me is really important, is that if you think about the main asset of such service organizations, it's really the, the skilled manpower. It's, it's, um, it's, not a, it's not a skill in the sort of same sense as a, as a clinician or a um, engineer or a lawyer, but ultimately it's a specialized experience which um, pest control companies have. There's investment in training, which is done in safe handling of pesticides and use of you know, specialized equipment. Um, but that specialized equipment and that, that you know, it's quite a labor intensive activity, specific training might be necessary, especially in interventions or applications which are outside of the normal scope of pest control operations. And I think it's fair to say that some mosquito control operations or some mosquito control interventions are quite easily outside of the scope of normal pest control practice. So that might mean that there is a need for such pest control service organizations to assign and train dedicated vector control teams. If they do that, then if you think about even within your own organizations, when you have employees or colleagues who do training and have an investment in them, there's an expectation that that training elevates them in terms of their, um, their position within the company. And there's an obviously expectation that you know, there might be some remuneration benefit from that. So, so there might be an expectation that these more trained technicians actually have to be paid more than some of the technicians who are not so specialized and don't have those skills. That has an influence therefore on, on uh, expectation of return on investment from dedicating time to vector control operations for public health or um, public sector uh, contracts. Um, and that last point is really important is it's ultimately um, the pest control company can probably make more profit and get a, a higher return on investment from pest control contracts with commercial commercial businesses. That's a, it, it's, you know, it's, there's more money available in business. Um, so that's probably the case, probably. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but and I think this is also important to think about are these, these other motivations and considerations. So money, money isn't everything. It's important in, in, obviously to these businesses, but there might be other considerations. And I think this, um, this kudos or this credibility, which can be attained by at a, at a pest control company brand level is by being able to say that they're involved in supporting or protecting public health through, through vector control activities. I think there's, um, you know, even companies such as ourselves and manufacturers and the crop life members, I think we all take particular pride and we really um, strive to be more and more involved in supporting the vector control fight against uh, vector-borne diseases. Um, and I think there are pest control companies that um, probably feel the same way and they may, they may consider the balance between profit versus brand visibility, credibility, and what the long-term gain is from, from being involved in such activities. Um, so the other point which I already raised about if they're investing in specific training of their technicians and have a dedicated team, on the one hand, yes, that might mean they have to maybe remunerate those technicians at a higher level than some of their others, but it's actually also a really nice way to motivate and develop and potentially retain good employees in terms of a development plan for their, um, for their job. Um, there's also this element of uh, even, if, even if they might have a lower profitability expectation or return on investment expectation from, the, from a you know, a higher labor sort of intensive contract for public health or mosquito control programs. Um, be, having the ability to be specialized and service a specialized segment might actually give them a more stable comp component of their business, especially if they can sort of carve out a niche or a um, yeah, recognized position within that at a, at a national or a regional level. Um, that might mean that maybe they could command you know, perhaps long-term contracts um, over an you know, extended period of time, which would then allow them better predictability in their business. Um, and that might weigh up against the, the higher volatility in the commercial sector. Um, but, and this, this last point sort of touches on this, is that uh, if they're gonna make that investment in training and skilling up their specialized teams, then, if from a return on investment perspective, it's really difficult to see that return on investment realized if that skilled team is only employed on a part-time or irregular basis. So 
So if they are, you know, for only two months of the year or three months of the year required to service particular contract in mosquito control, vector control, then the rest of the year they're doing back at, I don't know, rodent control, cockroach control, or other different skill sets needed. Then it, it's, it might be a, a question of, you know, cost management at a company perspective. So this um, idea of, um, developing a skilled and specialized team, which has the ability to serve the needs of, of public health programs, um, but are on demand and available and utilized over a longer period rather than intermittently. I think that's quite important from a, from a commercial perspective. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so when we as manufacturers um, work with the pest control or pest management industry, we typically tend to sort of, um, you know, we have various marketing initiatives and we look at different partnerships and, and, and supply arrangements um, through our distribution network. But quite typically, we sort of do profiling of organizations and profiling of markets. And in this particular professional pest management market, we tend to look at things a little bit this way. And this, this is very much from a Bayer perspective, but I think it's, it's pretty much shared by the other crop life members as well. So I already touched on this to some degree in the, in the early slide, but there's obviously the, the large international brands, you know, the likes of the Renticles, the Eco Labs, and some of the others like that. Um, you know, as a large international brand with a large amount of resources, they, they probably have access to more resources and expertise than perhaps smaller companies. Not always the case, but maybe the case, probably the case. But conversely, they might also have ambitious growth targets. You know, some of those companies are publicly listed in, in certain stock markets. So they might have growth targets and expectation of higher returns on investment compared to um, you know, smaller or medium-sized local brands. Um, they're also, though, likely to have higher overheads and thus they therefore need to drive more profit in order to get that, that return on investment. Um, but then also this, this bottom point, which comes back you know, to my previous slide, is that they also have a lot of investment in brand reputation and they're really interested in that. And that's, um, I think, really important. Um, sorry, I'm just getting a message saying my internet connection is unstable. So if I start breaking up, please shout out. Um, the, on the, in the middle column here is the large to medium, and I've, I've called these local brands. They might be regional brands, but it's, it's sort of, you know, less the sort of the larger international brands. Generally, we'd consider them to compete in the same space as the large international brands. They might have similar size workforce and training levels, and certainly, you know, very high levels of professionalism. And I've put in here perhaps, you know, even more locally specialized and knowledgeable than some of the large international brands who might have only entered into the country at a, at a later date compared to the existence of these, these local companies. Um, due to their smaller size um, and perhaps different types of growth targets and different types of management, they may have more cost flexibility and thus might be able to handle different kinds of profitability levels because they have a different return on investment expectation. And then, and then from the smaller local companies, that's you know, much smaller number of employees, maybe um, you know, less than 10 perhaps, um, you know, may not match the manpower needs for larger scale vector control operations to support public health. They might have less flexibility in taking technicians off work of other contracts to do specific training or specific you know, work in, in mosquito control. But they also may have lower cost structures, so they can they can offer lower price, but they might have the capacity to do so much. So, um, so it's really difficult to sort of say categorically which of those kinds of segments of the industry are best best suited to support vector control in in public health. Um, but I think it's you know it comes down to dialogue with each of those different con con companies, understanding the needs, the gaps that you have within the, in the um, public sector and where the capacities of each of those types of profiles of organizations can best fit. Uh, next slide, please. Um, regulations and licensing and training is, is really important. Um, and uh, I know there's a, there's a large scope of countries within, within the region in question here and training levels, um, and licensing requirements obviously will vary across different countries. Um, I, I'm, I spent some time in, in Australia and I went through pest control licensing many years ago before I worked for Bayer when I actually worked for Rentakill. And um, you know, I, I did the, the basic pest control licensing, if you like. And uh, in Australia, you know, mosquitoes was a very small part of that. There was much more focus on 
if you like, the bread and butter kind of pests, which pest control represents, which in Australia was rodents, insects, ants, and to some degree termites. Um, but there's going to be different needs in different countries, and I'm not really in a position to comment in terms of the course content for pest control licensing in, in your countries, but obviously that's an important part to understand. Um, but I do think the you know some of the specialised applications probably would include or need um, supplementary courses or supplementary units to the standard pest control licensing. Um, and I think obviously there's a there's a role to consider in terms of the health department and the, and the vet control program department in, in contributing to that training and what kind of certification is available to recognize that training so that, you know, perhaps you have a, a list of certified pest control companies that have, you know, addressed a certain number of minimum units or required units to be able to service your needs when a, when a tender or a service contract uh, comes up. Um, and on that point, in terms of developing that, that, that register of certified companies, you know, is there a national pest management association in the country that can help coordinate that with you um, and, and help develop that? Because there should be a, I would expect there would be a link between that association and some of the licensing requirements as well. So again, it's just a, just a thought in terms of some of the additional dialogue with other departments and other organizations in countries to sort of get an understanding about their, their capacity. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think one of the key assets, if you like, of the pest control industry, pest control service industry, is obviously the expertise and familiarity with safe handling of pesticides. You know, it's, it's um, I won't say it's every day, but obviously they do it much more frequently than some other um, sections of, of um, employment. Um, uh, they obviously have access and it's part of their um, suite of tools, the application equipment for residual spraying usually. Um, space spraying perhaps not always um but ppe is also you know part of their everyday equipment so you know does their access to that and their everyday use of that give you a potential benefit in terms of reduced cost in terms of um uh, vector control or use of insecticides for vector control um and there's a there's a third point here which i think is important which is um we as manufacturers develop usually and it's not always but usually we develop quite dedicated formulations and use patterns for vector control products and when i say vector control products i mean those that are intended for um who pq pathway um and, they, and they're not often the same they're not often not, they're not always the same products used in commercial pest control sometimes they might be the same formulations but usually the application rate and the use pattern is, is quite different. And I, I take for an example, a Bayer product, um, an active ingredient, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, Delta Methrin. Um, in uh, indoor residual spraying under the WHO PQ um, listed or um, listed use pattern, the application rate is 20 to 25 milligrams per square meter for residual spraying at um, malaria mosquitoes. Um, for professional pest control, the use rate tends to be in the range of 7.5 to sort of 15 milligrams per square meter, because there isn't always that same desired level of residual activity in those kinds of settings, because there's um, quite often there's repeat, you know, there's, within pest control con contracts, there's usually a, you know, a, an inspection service, which is provided as part of a treatment as well. Um, and so they don't necessarily need to last as long. So pest control, companies may not have access to the same PQ listed products through their distribution networks as we as manufacturers supply when we're approached for in, in terms of procurement for indoor residual spraying programs, which I think is an important point as well. That access to products is an important point. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just a, just a few other considerations here, and I know I'm not really, uh, I'm not providing answers here. I'm really just highlighting more questions, but again, it's just to sort of understand better some of the, um, uh, some of the motivations and requirements. But, you know, if there's specialized re equipment, is it available, is, that's required? Is it available to a pest control company? You know, a, a truck mounted thermal fogger or even handheld foggers or ULV equipment, it's quite expensive for certain pest control companies becomes more expensive if, if it's only used for a limited period of time. So it comes back to that point about, you know, if they can um, 
they can use it more frequently than the value goes higher and it means their initial investment they have a, they have a higher return on investment through that through that use um, but then of course um, and I, I have to apologize I only realized that this was really an 80s focused uh, session when I saw the agenda come out yesterday but um, you know so this this last point is probably more relevant but I could have made it more maybe 80s relevant in some of my other session that's uh, other slides um, but uh, when we look at sort of more focused larvicidine application, you know, perhaps there's the opportunity there for some of those smaller companies across different regions to handle some sort of a more fragmented task. But then there's a, obviously there's a co coordinator, uh, sorry, coordination challenge, which um, is incumbent then across managing different companies across, across different regions. But it's really gonna depend on the geography and the sort of the, the, the scale of, of um, work needed. Um, the pesticide management part, I already touched on this in terms of pest control service companies being familiar with, with uh, safe handling pesticides, but also this pesticide storage and licensing, you know, access to the distribution network, which they have, um, you know, there might be benefits to consideration of, you know, them uh, basically assuming the management of that part. Uh, and it's something you don't have to worry about in the, in the public sector. Um, and this, this uh, penultimate point, I've kind of addressed this already, but the, you know, does the local distributor, which supplies products to the pest control service company, do they have access to the specialized formulations? They may not. Um, I'm just checking how I'm doing for time. I'm about, still have about 10 minutes. Is that right, Ali? Uh, yes, exactly. You have 10 more minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, the, then the last point here about relevant training. So is, is relevant training available to the pest control company? And you know, if it's not, who can help? Um, and this leads a nice little segue into the next section. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, you know, I'll wrap it all up, but ultimately this is gonna lead back to manufacturers such as ourselves, but I'll just quickly summarize some of the key points and what I've covered already. But you know, these pest control service companies, they need to make money, but their involvement in vector control programs may also appeal to brand image. And I don't think that, I think it's really important not to forget that. You know, these different size companies might have different cost dynamics and capacity and, and expertise and capacities that needs to be considered. You know, that that development of the expertise and the investment in that is has a has an investment and a cost attached to it. And there's a return on investment which needs to be recognized. The more frequent those assets are used, the higher the return on investment. So Long-term contracts may very well incentivize pest control companies to invest in such things, and that therefore would increase the capacity. Um, so in, as a sort of closing for this first section on the pest control service companies, you know, I, my recommendation is really to be sort of, you know, really clear about the gap in your own resources that you need to fill. Um, you know, uh, understand uh, the part that, of the, or the, the PCO capacity and the, the development at a training level which exists. Um, and if it's not at a standard which you recognize then find ways to have you know dialogue with both the companies but pest control associations and especially um local mosquito control associations to to develop you know basically what you what you expect and what you need um and i'd suggest that we as manufacturers can also play a facilitating role here if it's necessary and that's my segue on to the next section which i'll cover quickly uh, next slide please um actually you can and then the next slide again. So this this final section is just to speak a little bit about pesticide manufacturers. Um, yeah, I think I think we play an important role in this. We are um, we have very strong involvement. Well, first of all, we have a long term commitment towards serving the needs of vector control. I think there's you know there's companies names there you recognise that have invested into vector control portfolio and and pipeline um, for some time, and have, and have recognised suppliers for malaria and vector control and dengue, vector, um, dengue control as well. Um, but we have this, you know, this strong involvement in both the vector control and professional pest management industries. So I'd really put it out there, you know, consider using us as a facilitator in that dialogue if necessary. I think we're, we're very happy to do that. Um, you know, we, we're maintaining a pipeline of new modes of action. Um, we're investing in product innovation. We have a very strong focus on stewardship as well. And I think Crop Life International, you know, that's one of the important remits they have and as crop life international um, member companies we hold that you know as a very very high um, uh, level of importance in stewardship safety and proper regulation um, we are um, you know we also have the opportunity to contribute knowledge and expertise to guideline development sometimes um, and we have oh, actually i'll skip to the last point because some of the other um, 
points I'll cover in some other slides, but you know, a very strong and conscious support to IRM, insecticide resistance management, and IVM, you know, integrated vector management. I think we're all we're all very strongly supportive of that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I will cover this one slide, but just this is really just to illustrate our commitment. You may have heard of this initiative called Zero by 40, which was a you know IVCC driven and gate supported initiative to bring um, some of us together, some of the um, manufacturing companies together. It's really just you know in 2018 us signing a commitment to stay the course to continue to invest. And if you can actually skip ahead two slides, please to yeah, continue to invest um, to ensure that we maintain vector control on our radar and horizon for R&D investment, to also talk to each other, which I think is a really important thing. And that's part of the message of this presentation is, is generally is, is you know, talking to each other and understanding each other and having dialogue. Um, you know, we have to be careful when we do that with each other in terms of competing interests. But I think we've, through Zero by 40, there is a platform where we can talk about and have you know have dialogue about the sort of the bigger picture and how you know putting our commercial and competing interests aside how can we work together to better support the goals of in this case malaria illumination but i think we can you know we could put together um you know ntd um uh, control and, and the fight against ntds as well uh next slide please um this is really just an illustration of, you know, honestly, I think that if you look at the past five years of what's come out of um, or through the, the PQ process in terms of um, PQ listed and supported products and, and hoop is obviously before that. Um, you know, the last five years has sort of been a, a wave of new um, new products. There's you know, new longer lasting formulations such as Actelic 300 CS. You know, combination long lasting nets, you know, the first one from um, BSF with Interceptor G2 and a, a new mode of action within that as well. You know, new modes of action for indoor uh, spraying, um, Sumitomo Sumashield and, and uh, you know, long lasting larvicides such as Simulav. Um, and then, you know, combination products, you know, such as fluvial fusion from ourselves and, you know, and a brand new chemistry, a butenolide class, you know, in space spraying with fluvial Comax, which was, which was just PQ listed in December. So. So the last five years has really seen you know, a massive wave of new products, um, far more so than the preceding um, um, you know, five, 10, even, even 15 or 20 years. Um, and I think that's a real sort of reflection of the commitment and investment we're making. Uh, and if we look forward, the next slide, please. Um, you know, if we look forward, the future pipeline looks quite good as well. Um, not all of this is coming from Crop life member companies, but that doesn't really matter in the, for the purposes of you know the fight against malaria and vector-borne disease. But you know, three new modes of action expected to complement the range for IRS, which is you know it's going to be incredible range of uh, mode of action options available. Hopefully, assuming they all get their PQ support. Um, you know, additional new nets containing new mixtures of active ingredients and you know, some some new intervention paradigms potentially within the next five years. So it's 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 quite an exciting time, I think. And there's, you know, in, in some respects, it's never been so good in terms of the tools available. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I might skip through some of these very quickly. But basically, you know, the from the stewardship and waste management is something whether we're all very conscious of. Um, and uh, not just the responsible use um, and correct handling. And I think that's where you know, this, this linkage we have with the pest control service industry is also important in the development of our, our products uh, and understanding of, of what, what suits, excuse me, what, what suits and matches their needs and their capacities. Um, but also in waste management, I think this is really, you know, more and more becoming an a, um, important topic in terms of uh, how do we make sure there's proper waste disposal of, of used packaging um, yeah, there's empty container collection programs, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'll just highlight one point on this, and I think I've already said it, but you know, our focus as um, an involvement in, in uh, you know, principles for regulation is, is very high. Uh, it's really important we have strong and, and robust regulatory mechanisms. Um, and you know we all have a, a role in that and crop life international plays a very important role in that as well as representing industry um, in some of those platforms uh next slide please um 
And from an advocacy perspective, I'll spend a little bit more time on this slide. I think in the context of vector control, public health and involvement of pest control service industry, I think there's, um, you know, we as manufacturers certainly, you know, volunteer time and expertise in different initiatives, um, whether it be the RBM partnership with, with the vector control working group or, or in other um, uh, working groups and development of codes of conduct or data quality task forces, things like that. Um, I think our involvement in that, we've, we've also seen, I've had an experience myself with um, some of our contacts with international brand pest control companies or pest control service companies who we've been able to bring into, for example, the vector control, IBM vector control working group, and they're starting to sort of develop their network through that mechanism. So there's a, you know, there's, there's a role that's um, uh, yeah, networking and bridging, which um, the, the two sort of sectors can play together. Um, Next slide, please. Um, uh, this is a little bit of repetition in the first part, but I, I will highlight it again. You know, professional pest management does represent a significant part of a business. You know, we have a, we have big teams which are servicing the pest control um, industry. For the most part, we have um, either distribution agent, uh, distributors, or um, partners, or um, direct representation in countries. Um, and we're quite often involved in providing product training. And there's, there's some countries where the training that we've developed uh, also is locally recognized through continuing education um, providers as providing these continual professional development qualifications, which in some countries, and again, I'm, I'm talking from my own experience from Australia, these, these CPD or continuing professional development qualifications are seen as, as useful and valuable in development of a technician's um, uh scaling up to you know higher remuner remuneration levels um you know we also work with pco service companies uh in exploring new technologies and we you know involve them in product development trials um and i'll highlight again um you know we don't always have the same formulations for the pco industry or pest control industry as we do in vector control so we need to bear that in mind uh, next slide please uh these are just a few examples. Maybe I'll skip this because I'm conscious that we've probably only got a few minutes left now, or I'm maybe even going to get the wrap up very soon. But maybe maybe I'll just highlight um, maybe I'll just highlight the last point because I think it's a it's a good example of um, you know this sort of multi sector or multi partner initiatives. Um, so um, we have been working on a um, with a consortium or a group of consortium to look at. Um, how integrated vector control activities can uh, provide measurable epidemiological, epidemiological impact on, on dengue incidents in, in Malaysia. Um, IMRs involved in that um, uh, Malaysia. There's also a pest control company. So there's a pest control company which has been engaged to do some of the servicing of the um, of the, um, auto dissemination traps uh, and um, and some of the spraying with the um, residual spraying as well. Um, so that's it. and there's a so there's a component of a pesticide manufacturing company, pest control service company, who's developing a knowledge and a greater knowledge and sound understanding of the of the needs. Um, you have the Institute of Medical Research. You have um, other academic institutions involved. Um, and that sharing of knowledge is ultimately seen as going to be beneficial for all parties in terms of how how such organizations can work together on such an initiative. Um, next slide, please. So really just then to quickly wrap up, I think we, you know, I would say uh, just as a motherhood statement, we are committed, um, we're open-minded and we're approachable. And I'd, I'd really encourage approach and dialogue with us in terms of how we can support in this. We have, you know, resources available to also support such initiatives um, sometimes. Um, we, you know, we're really interested on win-win outcomes. So we're, we're interested in, you know, mutually beneficial results. Um, and, you know, this fourth, third point, you know, we recognize the need to listen. We don't have the answers. Um, and for us to be successful, we need to be relevant to you. And I think that's, um, that's, that's uh, valid for pest control sorry, the pest industry or the pesticide industry manufacturers such as ourselves, but also to obviously to pest control service providers. So, you know, that, that dialogue is important, understanding the needs, uh, understanding the motivations, 
Um, and hopefully with, you know, further dialogue and exploration, we can find solutions to, you know, to better integrate and involve pest control service companies in, in supporting the needs. So I'll close off with that last point, which is essentially, you know, we welcome further dialogue and thank you very much.